All right. Good morning, church. We're going to jump in. Welcome to church. If you would, I know people are still kind of slowly trickling in. If you would just greet the neighbor in the pew that you're sitting in. Tell them good morning. Stand up. Say good morning. Come on. Get around. Move. Let's go ahead and make our way to our seats. I would like to, at this time, invite the, the balcony. There's, there's apparently plenty of, of things happening this weekend, so we've got a lot of space down here. You are welcome to join us. I, I, I learned earlier, apparently people sit up here because they think it makes them closer to Jesus. Or, yeah. uh, uh -huh. But before we jump too far into our announcements, I want to address something because I had so many of you concerned and worried about my well-being yesterday, given the U of I Michigan yeah. game. <laughs> and, I, and I simply, not to, in, in good sportsmanship, you know, when, when there's special days such as a 100-year dedication of a stadium, you, it's always good for the home team to win. And so in the, in the world of good sportsmanship, I think the Michigan Wolverines made the, made the, the gesture of being the bigger team <laughs> and allowing U of I to have a great, great day. No. <laughs> and as you can see, even in my own home, it is strongly supported against me as my son wears orange and blue, as does my father. But anyway, that's okay. Uh, how about those lines, though, right? Yeah. Yep. Go ahead, show it off, show it off. Right, right. All in good fun, all in good fun. But yes, congrats to you of I, folks. I'm happy you got a win. Woo. We're still reigning national championships. Anyway, so today after church, we will be having Sunday School Lawrence. Yes, we'll be meeting Harvey's. You guys got me because I've got singing and dancing going on. And then where's JC? Yes. That's JC saying that she is terrified and doesn't want to teach. Okay, yep. So they will be meeting. <laughs> so Sunday schools will be meeting immediately following service. So stick around, get connected, join one of those. And, and the only one that truly has an age requirement, and it's only because of the limited amount of space, is the youth one, the swag group. But uh, the other two, I want to encourage, it's not an age thing. It's you want to dive further into God's Word and learn more. So please stick around and be in one of those. Then... Today at 4.30, the Swag Harvest Hoedown Harvest Party will, oh, sorry, I got excited. Party will be happening at 4.30. I want to again encourage, if you know any kiddos from ages 6th grade all the way through uh, seniors in high school, we would love to have them come out and be part of this event. The Harveys have put a lot of work into this. I just recently learned, am I allowed to share a little bit of stuff? Can I share? It might not be like... A healthy thing to talk about in church, but we're going to talk about it. Um, we will be blowing up a pumpkin. Jared said, "Is it?" And I love that Jared requested permission to do it. He sent me a message and said, "Hey, I've got about two pounds of tannerite. Can we blow up a pumpkin?" I said, two pounds. Let's make it fun and do four." But <laughs> so, in the event that you just want to see some cool explosion action with a pumpkin, we invite you to come out and see that, kiddos. Also, there will be carving contests, a hot dog roast, and a hay ride. Um, I'm told there's going to be lots of other goodies. What kind of prizes is there? Can we share? Is there one prize we can share? Money. There you go. <laughs> Junior high, high school, one of the prizes is money. Cold, hard cash. Can't beat it. Come out. See? Um, and then I would show you where the offering boxes are next week. But... <laughs> 
we, we're hoping for a good turnout. I think we've got two hayride, two hayride, I don't know how to say it, wagons, yeah, prepared to do. So come, maybe a little scary. I don't know. We'll find out. So join us tonight at 4.30. And I put 7.30 as an end date, end time, but we're not sure if it goes longer, it goes longer. Anywho. Then, Wednesday, we'll be wrapping up our Armor of God series, so I, I strongly encourage you to come. If you haven't yet, come to that. Here, we're going to kind of put all the pieces together before we jump into our next Wednesday night class. So again, come, and again, kindergarten through uh, fifth grade has a class as well. I'm assuming that's me making noise. I'm trying to ignore it. But anyway, and then again, October 24th at 6 p.m., 6 p.m., they will be packing Christmas boxes here. We end up getting our shipment of 200 boxes as well as our packing slips. So if you would like to come and even, I know some people don't like actually packing boxes, but it is a little bit of a chore just making the box itself. It does take a little finesse. So if you'd like to even just come and help be part of the assembly line of making the box itself, we would truly appreciate that. Um, treats and snacks and stuff will be here as well. I'm getting a thumbs up from Gloria, so even if you just come for that, you can try and sneak out without doing anything. I don't know, but we'd love to have you. And then our morning blessings, devotional and fellowship time will be again. This is a new thing. Um, we're hoping this can be something that we continue and get a lot of participation in. It will be at 9 a.m. on October 31st. There will be coffee, and again, Ray... We're not going to let Ray worry about the food. Miss Debbie's got us covered. She's going to make sure we have a nice, yummy treat. And so I encourage you, come. We'll be in God's Word. And, and there, there's something special about starting the day in God's Word. Now, where I like to start the day in God's Word is typically roughly around 5.30, 6 a.m. So this is going to be close to lunchtime to me. But since Miss Debbie's bringing a meal, I'm excited. So I'm going to be here. So come be part of the fellowship and the devotional time with us. I think this has the potential to be something really great. You you don't have to be a member of our church to, to be at this either. If you know someone in the community that doesn't have anything going on at 9 a.m. on October 31st, bring them up. We'd love to have them here as well. And then, trunk or treat. We put on here 4.30. Um, I know some folks that's going to be hard giving the... Uh, Time, getting out of work and things like that, but we kind of want to have ourselves ready, set up, prepared, because trick-or-treating starts at five, right? And so if possible, if you want to come sooner than then and have your car set up, we're totally okay with that. We just want to kind of have a time to really buckle down and make sure we're here and prepared. I will say for the morning devotional and the trunk-or-treat, back on the sign-up boards, there's a clipboard on both sides for both events. So please, as you're leaving church today, go back there, sign up, let us know your theme um, for your trunk or treat as well as if you're interested in being here for the 31st the morning devotional time so please do sign up in the, at the back of the sanctuary by our sign up boards for those and then I have to put this out here early because there's always that family that tries to use this excuse with me November 3rd is time change do not be the person that shows up mid sermon because I will recognize you it happens all the time. Right now, someone's going to go, well, I wasn't there when you announced it. Well, you've also been living in this world long enough to know time changes. Plus, these cell phones we have, they do them automatically, right? And so don't be the person that walks in at 10 when I'm mid-sermon and go, hey, did you get that extra hour of sleep? But anyway, fall back Sunday, November 3rd. Make sure to put that on your calendar now. Do not forget that, all right? And then I will turn this over to... Where's he at? There you are. To Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. We've got a few prayer requests this morning. One is Jeff Shamhart. If you guys recall, three weeks ago, um, they thought he maybe had lung cancer, and um, it's actually he's got a fungus growing in his lung. So. They're sending him to a specialist in Springfield, so let's be in prayer for Jeff. Let's be in prayer for uh, Sam and Karen, so we'll continue to pray for them. And then um, Anthea's friend from Greece, her name's Cameron, and she had surgery three weeks ago, and she's having complications, and um, they haven't found the cause. So let's be in, friend, be in prayer for Anthea's friend, Cameron. So... Um, 
We've got other prayer requests. So there's stuff that we need to pray for. So let's um, um, be in prayer for our church ministries and um, just our church in general, too, as well. So uh, let's go to God in prayer. God, we just uh, we just we're excited to be here this morning and um, just to, with our friends and family to uh, just to worship you, God. And and it just feels good to be here with with the people we know and and um, just to grow closer to you, Lord. We just, that's what we want to do. We want to grow closer to you. God, and I just pray that we grow closer with each other and, and we become more of a, a connected church, God. And I and, uh, just pray you be with our, our church ministries, with our life groups and, and uh, what's going on in, uh, with, with those groups and the swag and, and children's church, God. I just pray you be with the teachers. I pray you be with the Sunday school teachers too, God, as we just learn more about you. Lord, we just... We pray for Pastor Anthony as he brings us the message, and, and I just pray you be with him, and um, we just uh, we just appreciate him and and what he's he's doing in our church, God. And I just pray you be with our church as we go forward, and and um, we just pray you be with um, the ones on our prayer list, Lord. I just pray you be with Jeff and and Jeff Shamhart as he goes through his. Um, uh, just uh, as he, he goes through his, his infection in his lungs. And I pray you be with Sam and Karen, God, and you just be with them. And I pray you be with Anthea's friend from Greece and you uh, just help her heal and, and just be with the doctors, God. And Lord, we, um, we all have emotional or physical, spiritual, financial issues going on. Each one of us do. And Lord, we just lay those down at your feet and, and just forget about those right now. And we just 100% focus on you for the next hour and, and, and um, help us do that, God. I just pray that we take, you take all those little thoughts out of our head and we just focus on you and, and what you've done for us, Lord. And we just thank you for everything you've given us. We just thank you that you gave us your son, Jesus, to um, die on the cross and pay the, the ultimate sacrifice that we don't have to have a spiritual death, God, and we can just live with an eternity with you. And we just thank you so much for that. And we just thank you that you're a forgiving God and you're a loving God, Lord. And we just pray that you forgive us when we do something wrong. And in your name we pray. Amen. Today. I'm happy. Yeah, thanks. Um, we're going to be using 252 for our first hymn. There's a sweet, sweet spirit. Someone just say, what do you think of when you think of the word sweet? Sugar, Pauline says. What else? Sweet. Your wife, oh, thank you, Bob. That's so sweet. <laughs> Jim, what about you? I just saw you made a point or two there. Oh, you were going to say Bev, I bet. Sure. <laughs> think of babies, kitties, puppies. I think of a smell of something good being cooked and that aroma just rising up in the air. But this hymn we're going to sing takes us to a new level on the word sweet. It's going to be 252 in page number, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. Let's stand and sing this hymn, Our Church People.
again. This song is too short for as good as it is. our voices in praise this morning.
kiddos, have fun. Is it okay if I hang out with you? Yes, sir. So again, um, the youth have kind of abandoned me up here at the front now. Now they're sitting with moms and dads again, and that's okay, I guess. I just feel a little left out. But um, I want to again encourage Drew offered to read scripture for us today. But if any of you, as, as members of the body, if you would like to read scripture one Sunday, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. I'd, I'd love to have us not just doing this as the young people of the church have to do it, or the, you know the the pastor has to do it. We're all God's children. We're all called to proclaim in reading of his word. Amen? And so if, if you are willing and would be willing to step out in a little bit of awkwardness and uncomfort. It's only a little bit uncomfortable up here, right? It's not that bad? A little bit, not that bad. Not that bad. Just don't look at anybody. All right. All right? <laughs> just, just, just stare at the paper. No, I'm just kidding. But we, we strongly want to encourage that, that our church is a church that everyone speaks God's holy word over one another. All right? So Drew, if you would, brother, take it away. Good morning, church. Turn to Romans 12, 17 through 21. <clears throat> Repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but be overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Take it with you. You can have it. Cheers now. <laughs> Give a sermon like that. be unfortunate. No, it's just my tight jeans. <laughs> Jeez. All right, church. There's enough laughing. Here we go. Let's open up our, our copy of God's Word, or if you're using your phone, do so. Get to Romans chapter 12, and hey, strap in. I wore a coat because I knew I'd get super hot and bothered probably today, and I wanted an excuse not to move around as much and sweat. There you go. But with today's Word, as soon as I can get my stuff to act right, there we go. I want us to sit and think, all of us are wounded by words and actions of others. Through flashbacks, though, with the life of Christ, we see how to respond to those who intentionally did evil against him and how he didn't react the way that we would choose today. Right? And so, so I can't help but sit and think, have you ever been wronged? Yeah, fair enough. Have you ever been wronged by someone that you love? Or someone you trusted? By best friend, even? I want you to think about that for a moment. What was your immediate response? Was it, it's okay, I love you, come here, bring it in? Or was it, you had to prove a point? You had to say something. You had to be hurtful back. What, 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 was, re, what was your reaction to being hurt? Sometimes, some of us are even so wrapped up in the fact that if someone around us gets hurt by somebody, we now become very defensive too, right? Because we want to protect the ones that we love. Did you know one of the best ways to protect those that you love is by showing them God's gospel on display? 
well, that doesn't sound like I get to hit anybody, Anthony, or get to, to slander anyone's name if I do that. You're right, you don't. Instead, you get to be one who is of Christ. You get to be a disciple in that moment and love in all circumstances. How good are we at practicing that as Christians? See, you all just laughed at me about my tight jeans, but now you're all sitting here going, oh, that was kind of mean. It was funny, though, right? I, I, want you, I want you all to be able to jump in today's text and realize that the text behind me on the screen right now is one that is honestly one of the most common, unforgotten, thi most forgotten things of a Christian. Because we, we truly do not understand that vengeance is his. It says here in Scripture, vengeance is mine. Not ours. It doesn't say in God's word that vengeance is yours. Vengeance is mine. Vengeance is for God to seek and have, not us. Do you understand that? Because if vengeance was truly yours, that's fine. Get in line. Have it. There's a place called hell. And you can take all the vengeance you want on those that you love and care for. Because as a Christian, you're called to love all. Not some. Not only the ones that are nice to you, not only the ones that sit in your pew, not only the ones that, that like the same team as you, right? But we create these sub things in our lives. And so I want to talk five things. I'm going to do the, the backwards Baptist way. Instead of wrapping us up with three points in the sermon at the end, I'm going to give you five points at the beginning, and then we're going to break this down verse by verse. Is that okay? Does that sound good? Today would be a great day if you're a note taker, have two pencils ready. Okay, or a spare ink cartridge. From Paul's teaching, we learn how God wants us to handle hurtful situations caused by others. First, plain and simple, do no evil. Well, that's easy. How many of you did an evil thing already today? Those of you that already know you did an evil thing, I'm worried. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm serious, though. Most of us probably started our day not with the intentions of doing evil, but may have already stumbled into it. It is never the will of God that when a person inflicts evil on us, that we inflict evil to them in return. Rather, evil actions, evil words, evil gossip, Paul says to be careful to do what is right in the eye of everyone, in verse 17. Rather than reacting in the flesh by saying or doing the first thing that enters your mind, we need to give careful thought to the way we respond to those who hurt us. Our responses are called to be honorable. Just a few verses back, we talked about outdoing one another with honor. Right? And what's sad is even in this moment, Paul feels the need that he still has to remind you again, hey, don't do evil. Be honorable. Isn't that bad? That we need constant reminder? I always find it halfway comical that the church, guess what? The church has been around for a long time, has it not? God's Bible, the Holy Word, has been around for a long time. Do you not think that we repeat ourselves a bunch in church? Right? Yet we still can't seem to figure it out. I remember being a, a student, and it's one of those, I, a teacher would tell me, you got to do it like this, you got to do it like this. I'm like, does it matter if I come up with the answer? Yeah, because it's, you got to have the process of how to do it. you got to understand so that you can teach somebody else. And then I would be a smart aleck, and well, I'm not a teacher, you are. <laughs> My job's to know what you taught, not teach it. But there's, there's pride in understanding when you can teach something, right? Because now you really know it. Does this make sense? Here's the struggle with Christians, I feel, in the church today. We don't really know this stuff because we do a horrible job at teaching it. Some of you may agree with that. Some of you may disagree with that. I'm here to sit and tell you, if we knew this well, if we knew this very, very well, a lot of the issues in today's world wouldn't be issues at all. Because we are so caught up with the minute we hear something, we want to react. If you're one of those people that you feel afterwards in an argument or in a confrontation with someone, you have to look to your spouse and they go, I was waiting for it. Because they saw you just bubbling about ready to react and say something. That's not a good thing. Some would sit and say, well, yeah, it is. I kept my tongue. I didn't say anything. I kept it all inside. Good. What would you do moments after that? Did you tell somebody else how oh, I was going to say this and I was going to do that and I was going to mention this and I was going to bring that up? Guess what? You still brought evil because now you're in the gossip part. 
Does this make sense? <laughs> I hate saying it. <laughs> we like to gossip as Christians, don't we? Is that true? Nobody wants to admit that they like to gossip, but we do that. We hear things we don't like, and we go and talk about it. Y'all, it is not naive to me. There was a time me and Aaron went out to um, lunch after church one Sunday, not here, at another church, um, and it was the day that I told her, I was like, now I understood why my pastor never went out to eat after church. He went home, or he stayed at church and worked. And it was because he sat in a booth and behind him, well, pastor this and that, and well, he says this and that, he doesn't know, and then the, the and just, just started railroading and badgering the guy's teaching. And then all I could sit and think when I sit and heard this happening directly towards me was, whoa, wait a minute. I'm a conversational kind of guy, if you haven't learned. I sat up and said, hey! And then, oh. <laughs> well, hi, Anthony. And I said, I just want you to know, I'm sorry that today you felt the sermon wasn't for you, but I also want you to know the sermon's not meant to be about you. It's not meant to, to make you feel good. It's not meant to be the thing that is all focused on ourselves. We don't come to church to be about us. We come to church to be with Christ. We come to church to learn how to be like him. But we forget that we can cause evil even when we're not the ones responding directly. When we take it outside the building and do it, it's evil. When you boast that you controlled yourself and not doing evil and bragged about how you didn't do evil, you're doing evil. <laughs> Does this make sense? I want us to understand that because, again, today is a, it's big. Okay? The second thing I want to talk about, do all you can to live peacefully with everyone. Are you doing all you can to live peacefully, peacefully with all? Ask yourself that. Or are you looking for things that, well, that's just not my crowd. That's not who I like hanging out with. They don't have as much in common with me. Here's an idea. Stop making it about you. This, this is a big struggle in churches because churches have different denominations and it becomes a, well, they don't believe the same things I do. Does that mean you can't be peaceful? Does that mean you can't love them? I had a great interaction. It's going to be a lot of storytelling today. I had a great interaction with a Jehovah Witness one day knocking on my front door. And y'all, there is no one who gets more excited than me when people come to my door and want to talk about the Bible. Sign me up. And this sweet lady, oh, she was so kind. And her husband was with her. And I think you guys were in the backyard, weren't you? Yeah. And so I'm, I go out front, and I'm like, hey, how you doing? And I saw, I already saw the pamphlet, and I'm like, whoo. I mean, it's a Tuesday and I get to talk about Jesus. Let's go. And she goes, can I just talk to you about your Lord and Savior? I was like, yes, you may. And she goes, well, do you know? And I'm like, how oh, do you know? And then she, she mentioned a scripture. And the gentleman kind of, he goes, you seem awfully excited, young man. And I said, yes, I had one moment. And I went and grabbed Big Bertha, my big study Bible. And I walked, on, I said, you go and then my turn. <laughs> And she goes, and she closed her Bible and looked at me and she goes, where do you go to church? And I was like, man, I'm part of the body that is the body of Christ. I just so happened to pastor a church down the road. And he goes, you're that guy. Yep. Mm -hmm. And they turned and walked off. <laughs> and I said in that moment, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. While me and you may not agree on everything, let's talk a little bit. I can tell you right now, I know six church members that are home. And I can set you up on their doors. But let's talk. And that gentleman looked at me and his response was, young man, I've never had someone willingly say, even though we don't agree on everything, that we could still talk about God's word. And I said, well, hey, let this tattooed, crazy, radical, Jesus-believing guy be the guy. We stood there for about another 10 minutes talking. His wife was upset. She wasn't, she wasn't a fan. But me and this gentleman ended up creating a slight bond to where it was, you know what? We can be peaceful with one another. Nobody has to sit and say, I'm the ultimate authority, not you. And at the end of it, I looked at him and said, hey, isn't it great that ultimate authority comes from God, not us? And he just kind of looked at me and said, you're right. And I said, amen, brother, you have a blessed day. And he goes, son, you have a blessed day. And I, I will never forget that interaction. 
Because most of us, let's just be honest, the minute you hear ding dong or your phone goes off from your doorbell and and someone's at the door and you see them, everybody has the attitude of... (laughs) They're here. (laughs) Right? Am I wrong? Hey, be honest, some of you are those people, like you see them through the, the window or something and you like hug the door... They're driving away now. Turn the lights back on. <laughs> As if they didn't see all the commotion and, and, and hear that inside, right? If you're real special, you have kiddos like mine that just stare at them at the door. <laughs> Do all you can to be peaceful with everyone. Living in peace with others, we must forgive those who offend us and do evil to us, just as Christ did. Live peaceful so that is that we seek reconciliation under the authority of God, not under the authority of ourselves. We are not rulers of this world. We are only inhabitants for the time. God is ultimate ruler, right? We need to be peaceful. The third thing I want to mention, do not take revenge on others. Rather than seeking to take action in your own hands, take action in the sense of loving someone and trusting the situation that God has a plan. Some of us map out like six courses of a rebuttal before the first sentence is ever finished. Some of us map out a a grand scheme, if you would, of how to get somebody back. Why do you give so much time in your thoughts in causing a problem? What good comes of it? It takes you away from your daily life, right? Don't be that person. Don't be the person that is consumed with trying to harm. My phrase that I love, and I'm trying to get the kids to mimic this as much as possible because I struggle, is let go and let God. Right? Or I'm going to have to start playing Frozen every Sunday for everybody with the little let it go. Let it go. Like, we need to learn. Don't laugh at that. That was a good attempt. (laughs) We need to learn that you have to let go wrongdoings towards you and not dwell in them. If I would have allowed things harmed towards me, hurtful words, things like that, y'all, life would have been horrible. I wouldn't be where I am today. I grew up in a gay household. I was destined to be a gay man, according to the society around me. And I was belittled and talked to that way. If I would have allowed every little comment to get to me, man, I would have spent my teen all the way into my adult years today trying to get people back. I don't need to do that. Vengeance is not mine. It is his. You think God doesn't see when you act like a non-believer and treat people that way? You understand, you answer for these actions you do in this world, right? Are you aware of that? Not everyone's agreeing right now. I'm getting kind of like that. Understand, he gives forgiveness when you accept it and you say the, 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 the salvation prayer of acceptance and you walk into your faith that way. Also acknowledge that you're, you're also towing the line and saying that one day I'll stand judgment for all that I have done. You're aware of this? It's not a sugar coat like, oh, it's okay, since you said that now, you just get to act like a wild heathen the rest of your life. No, that's not how that works. It is because of the fruits of what God has given you that you choose to do the works of a believer and to be a disciple, not one that seeks revenge, not one that seeks to do harm. The fourth thing I want to talk about is bless those who cause you pain rather than only seeking to put off our hurt and then live in an unneutral concerning those things of evil around us. Put on the radical attitude, put in a radical act as Paul is telling us to not only do, put off revenge and the desires of doing harm, but to put on doing good. This principle comes straight from Jesus' life and teachings. The fifth thing, we overcome evil in this world by doing good. Do you believe that one good deed can change the outcome of somebody's day? Do you believe that? When's the last time you attempted to do a good deed? Not for selfish pride in saying that you did a good deed, because some of us are those people like we'll do a, we'll do a nice gesture and then we'll we'll even like have to make the statement out loud to the car or to the house or to the table. Oh, my good deed for the day. And sometimes we say that to be comical and humorous, but sometimes we actually wear that. 
Sometimes we truly believe, oh, I did a good thing today. I'm good. I'm covered. You know that's not real, right? As a believer in Christ, you should just walk abundantly and generous to all, showing love and kindness and mercy in all things. Not in just one act to sit and say, umbrella now, it covers me for the week. But sometimes we take that attitude, right? And I know that's hard to hear. And again, I know you've just been staring at the text behind me going, okay, so that's what he's talking about. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the last verse that you're looking at up here. This command might seem like an impossible task. And as we saw earlier in this series, God wants our actions to be sincere. Whenever evil is committed against us and we submit our lives to God, he will take us on a journey of healing that allows us to overcome evil done to us with good. That's a lot, right? So look, since I know you've all memorized the verse behind me now because I left it up there, it was kind of like a, you didn't know you were part of my little experiment here. I wanted to see who all really just stared at it and who all heard what was getting said. So we're going to turn the tables. Who remembers what we just talked about? I'm just kidding. Relax. (laughs) Too many of you guys just went. (sighs) Flashback. Yep. Wake up. Relax. In Romans 12, the beginning of the chapter, Paul challenged us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. As we learn new patterns of thinking, our lives are transformed. Over time, we become people who are becoming more like Jesus. Listen, write this down. If you and I are not more like Jesus today than we were a year ago or two years ago, something is wrong. I I really want you to sit and and chew on that for a minute. If you are not becoming more and more like Christ each and every day, each and every week, then something is terribly wrong. One of the most radical transformations involve how we respond to the enemy, the people who oppose us, the people who wrong us with their words and actions. The most neutral response is to treat people the way that they have treated you. However, today, Paul challenges us to treat people much better, dramatically better, in fact, than they have ever treated you, treated you and I. This passage might actually stir up some painful memories and experiences in your life. You might remember of someone doing harm to you or you doing harm to another. Some healing might need to take place before anything else. And so I would ask that you pray on that, that you do seek reconciliation as it is taught to us in Scripture. Paul's teaching, again, echoes Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now is where it gets fun. Now we're going to dissect verse by verse, okay? Because again, y'all, as, as much as I love getting up here and sharing God's word with you, th- this is a text that n- not every minister gets excited about. Because this is one that many will sit and equip themselves as if it was, you were attacking me today in church. No, the Spirit convicted you, Okay? And this is where it gets almost kind of fun, too, because not everybody wants to talk to the pastor much after a sermon like today, because then they're like, well, if I say too much to him, he's going to bring it up and talk about me. It's not about you. (laughs) Stop. All right. It's about what this has to say. If you put yourself in it, congrats. Welcome to conviction. Let's fix it. Let's become disciples, not who you are today. Okay. Here we go. Repay no one, no one evil for evil, but give, we're going to stop there. Repay no one evil for evil. In the flesh, it is the most natural thing in the world to repay an act done against to an act back. Sometimes I realize that I just spent five minutes rehearsing a conversation I recently had. I've been thinking of insults and comebacks that I'd wish I'd say. I'm sure none of you have ever done this. That's a very neutral way to think. But as followers of Christ, we are not supposed to just respond quickly and rashly. Instead, we're to be slow to anger and slow to respond and yet loving. We're supposed to keep in step with the spirit and learn to respond to evil and insults the way Christ did. As he writes, repay no one evil for evil. Repay no one evil for evil. It sounds so easy, yet we make a mockery of it. Because the minute we go to the scene, repay no one evil, we go, well, I would pay it double. I'm telling you right now, moms, you're the worst. 
It's not a Mother's Day sermon, so it's okay. Moms, you're the worst. You know why? Because I've sit and I've talked to many, many moms. I live with a mother now. And you best believe that if somebody pushes your baby on the playground, you're ready to go hit a kid. <laughs> just the amount of women that just went is concerning. But that's your instinct. You want to protect yours, right? You want to love your child and protect them from the evil world and make sure that if someone steps against them, you're coming tenfold. But you're not supposed to. Did you know that? But don't get me wrong. Someone steps towards my kids, I'm ready to go too. But that's not what we're called to do. We're called to be the examples of what Christ is teaching us to be. We're called to be the ones that say, hey, just because they push you down doesn't mean you punch, kick, then push them. It means that you rectify the situation with understanding. You resolve. You seek clarity. Now, does that mean we're going to create a bunch of weak, passive people? No, we're going to make a bunch of strong, meek individuals that understand harm brings no good. Retaliation is not the answer. Reconciliation is. Husbands, don't think you get off easy either. Because boy, or mamas are all about the kids, husbands are all about your pride and ego. Heaven forbid someone be right and you be wrong. Heaven forbid somebody can teach you something new that you didn't already know. And instead, you would say, oh, well, it's because I had it rough. Or your response is evil rather than welcoming and thanking. Gentlemen, just because you're old and have gray hair does not mean that you're the most gifted individual in this world, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, depends who you ask. You can learn something from a child, can you not? Isn't that nice to admit that? Isn't it nice to admit that even every other man with gray hair or no hair may know something you don't? Isn't it nice to admit that she might be right? <laughs> Some of you. Mm. She's right on certain things. We don't have to be the one that's in a superior position and cause evil just by saying, no, you're wrong, it's this and this. I love the fact that, that women, again, are protective of the children and men are protective of pride and ego and knowledge, yet we do not need to repay evil with evil. Learn, love, show mercy understand. Paul then urges us to live in a way that others recognize as good and right. Even though some will ridicule you for your devotion to Christ, there remains a common morality with which almost everyone's agree, everyone agrees. Almost everyone sees the goodness of being merciful and generous and kind. Paul reminds us the part of our calling involves living a life that others acknowledge as good. Jesus himself said, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You're not called to show good works and do good things so people go, man, you're such a good Christian. You're a good person. No, it causes them to go, what makes them do this is the belief and glory to the Father that they serve. It's not about us. Does this make sense? You don't do good gestures and say, oh, well, hey, let me go ahead and cover this. I'll pay for that. Or, hey, I made this for this. Or I did this. If you are looking for the self-glorification, you've got it wrong. It's for people to see, like, no, they do that because they love Christ. They do that because he's changed their life. Not because they want to be seen as glory and honor, but because they want the Father to be. Let me ask this. As Christians, have you ever seen someone that you immediately in church go, oh, they only did that so people would see it? I mean, that's a bunch of stone faces. <laughs> Nobody ever in church does anything to get self-glorification, right? That's awkward. Y'all can take a deep breath. I'm not going to start pointing you out or anything. <sighs> You've seen that though, right? Be honest, you've seen that. You've even thought it before, I bet. Oh, they did that so everybody at church would know they did that. You've said those words. I'd ask that you forgive yourself of that. I'd ask that you remove that from your heart because it's wrong. You know why? It's evil. 
It is not for you to judge where one person stands in giving glory to God or themselves. It is for you to be a brother and sister who, though, intercedes in it and says, Hey, this is for Christ, right? Not you. Humble people. It's okay. We're not doing it to be mean. We're doing it to love and glorify who? Christ. Not ourselves. The wisdom in verse 18 now gets a little bit more uncomfortable. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Paul acknowledges that when you're in a relationship with someone else, not everything depends on you. Amen? Gentlemen? Amen? You would be lost wayward men without your spouse. Am I wrong? Some of you are in church today with either mom or grandma. Without them in your life, you'd be lost, right? There's a sense of dependence there. There's a sense of dependence in God, too, as a Christian. There's a sense of dependence in Christ. There's a sense of true dependence in the Holy Spirit. Are you depending on them, or have you taken action on your own? Think of that. You want to know how easy it is to be peaceful with one another? Stop thinking with your heart and mind. Use the one God gave you. That heart of flesh, not stone. That heart that says you don't have to be angry and mean all the time. Notice that Paul called, I'm sorry, some people are mean and vindictive, but if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everybody. This means that we should avoid provoking people whenever possible. Now, some of you are going to use the phrase here, yeah, Anthony, we just kill them with kindness. Why you got to kill them? Why can't you just be polite? Just be nice. Because if you're overly doing it, you're making a point to be overly nice to them, guess what? Evil. Because you're doing it to provoke. You're doing it to, to prove a point rather than doing it because it's what you're called to. Be peaceful. Does this make sense? I feel like we've taken a bad turn today. <laughs> Stay with me, y'all. <laughs> Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. One of my favorite uh, references of vengeance. Anybody Star Trek people? I'm a what? There's one sole person. You got to be proud to put your hand up for that, okay, Larry? Don't be ashamed. Anybody know what Star Wars is? Okay. So Star Trek are for real nerds, Larry. <laughs> Just kidding. There's a gentleman named Khan in, in Star Trek who's an evil guy, he's a bad guy, and wants to take everything out on people because his, his, his team, if you would, was a superior race. They were meant for war. They were meant to take over things. And while well, they, they put them aside and, and this and that, and, and Khan gets released, and he, he looks at Captain Kirk, and he says, Vengeance will be mine for all you have done. What do you think that means? What does that mean to have vengeance? That means to, to have some sort of wielding power. When I hear vengeance, I prepare for an attack, right? Authority in that. Vengeance isn't meant for you. We have the phrase, too, in common in English, you can't be judge, jury, and executioner, right? Because vengeance isn't meant to be yours. Vengeance is for God and God alone, not you. Now, some of us now are going, well, Anthony just said that God wants vengeance on us. Yeah, he does. If you didn't know that, I think you may have been reading the wrong Bible, I'm not saying God's coming at us with hailstorms of fire to try and doom us all. I'm saying that God says, I've given so much. Be my children, not that of the world. Be mine because I long for you. Not create your own panic, war, and destruction. God did an amazing thing to fulfill vengeance on us, did he not? The death of his son, maybe you recall. Why would you continue to try and control this world with your own vengeance then? If God's already satisfied all. Does this make sense? I'm going to ask that a lot here going forward because again, this is where things get kind of rocky. Notice that Paul calls the Roman Christians beloved. He reminds them that they are a people deeply loved by God. Instead of experiencing God's wrath, they experience God's love. 
Jesus experienced the wrath of God that we deserved. Jesus experienced the wrath of God that we deserve. To be put to death on a criminal's cross. Christ did that so you didn't have to. I want you to really like try and understand, and I mean, we're not at communion yet, but I want you to understand the imagery of that. Picture, if it's upon you to pay for your sins, this world wouldn't have buildings and skyscrapers and beautiful parks and schools and churches. It would be lined up with crosses with us hanging on them. Whereas it only took one to forgive every one of us. Have you ever pictured your cross? So this is going to get really deep for some of us right now. Have you ever pictured your cross? You know, it's beautiful. We, we have the great quote, three nails, one cross, four given, right? But I want you to sit and think, how many nails would it take for you to stay on a cross? Because you've never loved like Christ has. You've never shown that kind of peace because you've wanted vengeance as a human. As a person of the world, how many nails would it take to hold you there? Think of that. Because again, it wasn't nails that held Christ to the cross, was it? It was love for you and I. So what would your cross look like? How would you be held there? Because you're answering for all that you've done now. Not for your family that you have done. Because if you love like he did, you wouldn't need nails. Have you ever thought of that? It's kind of scary. This is where right now some of us are going, well, this is personal. This is convicting is what it is. Paul writes that as God's beloved people, we should never take our own revenge. Every single person will answer to God one day. We didn't have the right to play God. We still don't have the right to play God. Vengeance is not ours. We leave room for the wrath of God, and we believe God when he says, Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Inter interestingly, we will see next week in chapter 13 that the governing authorities have a God-given role of bringing wrath on one who practices evil. Of course, justice isn't always served in this life, but one day every single person will stand before our Creator. Those who are not clothed with the righteousness of Christ will experience as God's wrath and vengeance. As people who love God and as people who are loved by God, we shouldn't want for our enemies to have such horrible lives. We should not want our enemies to be in pain. Doesn't that sound odd to say? We shouldn't want our enemies to be in pain. So in verse 20 and 21, Paul tells us to treat our enemies in a way that invites them to repentance and faith. In verse 20, Paul gives specific ways to bless and not curse our enemies. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now let's talk about heaping burning coals on somebody. This is a great, like all of a sudden, this is very like direct, almost like poetry written style English, old English here. And then we get to heaping burning coals. Here's the problem. Some of us want to just heap coals. We forget the whole first part of this. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. All we see is the heap burning coals on their head. Hurt them. Cause pain. They're your enemy. Instead of taking revenge, we are to take opportunities to meet our enemy's needs. We are to give food and drink to people who would expect us to delight in their misfortune. Doing so will heap burning coals on their heads. It's difficult to say with certainty what Paul means by this imagery. Given the whole flow of this passage, he probably isn't saying that our generosity has the effect of destroying an enemy or bringing greater condemnation to them. Most theologians take this image of heaping burning coals on their heads to mean that our acts of kindness cause our enemies to blush with shame because they have tr been treated so much better than they deserve. Have you had that happen? Has someone treated you far better than you deserve? Gentlemen, look to that lovely lady next to you. You have been treated far better than you probably deserve. Ladies, look to that guy beside you. He is probably treated 
He probably could treat you better. Truth is, he could treat you better. <laughs> but what I'm getting at is you've had that moment of saying, I didn't deserve that, that uncomfort. I had an interaction at one point in my life where I had a very strong disagreement with an individual and I was ready and prepared for an argument to more or less create a large situation that didn't need to happen. And that person came up to me, grabbed my hand and said, you know what, Anthony, I've been thinking hard on this and I hate to say this and I don't want to say it in front of anyone, but I think me and you can fix this situation. I think we can resolve this. And I simply said, I don't deserve what you're saying because I have been preparing for a battle. And in that moment, I know I turned red because I, I, was, I was overcome with something that I never realized that, you know what, I wasted so much time for my wife and my children preparing for this situation to harm just to prove the point that this person came to me and heaped the burning coals on me. A person and I now stay in contact and has become a great friend. Someone will even respond to repent some will even respond to repentance that leads to salvation in Christ with this act of heaping coals. This interpretation fits well with verse twenty one, which then says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If we take revenge on our enemies, we are overcome by evil. If we prove it a point to hurt someone, we are overcome by evil. We become like those who have done evil to us. In doing so, there is a little or no possibility that their hearts will be softened. They will have fresh reasons to hate us. If we bless those who persecute us and give food and drink to the enemy, there's a possibility that we can overcome evil. There's obviously no guarantee in this, but there's possibility. Some of us will look at this area of Scripture and say, I have done nothing but been kind and generous and loving. And they still are rude and nasty and mean. Okay. Do you think Christ ever thought that once? And that changed his decision on how to live? Do you think God is ruling in the th throne room now with Jesus and saying, you know what, we have been so kind, loving, and generous to them, and yet they repay us with what they've done to our creation, and yet they repay us with how they treat one another? Let's end it. No, they've, n they've not done that. Because they love. They want us to have peace with them. God promised never to do what he done to the earth with the flood, right? And then leaves a remembrance of it with the rainbow, the bow, if you would, hanging in the sky. He, he didn't promise that something like that would never happen again, though, did he? And then even further, Christ comes to be the example of what we're to be with our enemies. And the truth is, church, the world didn't learn. The world didn't hear. And the sadder truth is, we know these truths. What are we doing to show that? Or are we just being another cog in the wheel to create repaying one's evil with another? I believe it was Muhammad Gandhi who said, eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Not to bring another spiritual person of a different faith in, but that quote is so true. But that quote, in my opinion, is inspired by what we have right here before us. God's holy truth. His word. And the last thing I want to point out is while I've sat and talked over and over about those who have done evil to you, how you should forgive and love them, feed them, give them drink, clothe them. You go further into the scripture, it'll talk about clothing them. How many people would look at you as their enemy that you have wronged and hurt? How many people have you not reconciled with because it went away or it's not talked about anymore? That's not reconciliation. Forget or ignorance is bliss is the moment, I think. That's not reconciliation. We're called to deal with these things. We're called to be above these things and be holy before Christ. To be holy, you need to be a disciple. To be a disciple, you need willing to be persecuted, hurt, and cast out. 
Where can you be the one who isn't just seeking forgiveness, but still forgiving? Sorry, there we go. There were multiple flashbacks into the life of Jesus that demonstrate how he did not repay the evil done to him with something cruel to others. Perhaps one of the most vivid flashbacks of Jesus returning good to those who did evil to him is truly seen at the cross. As Jesus hung on the cross, people mocked him, accused him, shouted, beat him, scoffed at him, and did many other horrible things. Still, Jesus, who could have righteously destroyed them all for the evil and their sins, did something astonishing. He prayed to them, prayed for them, to his Father, as he said, and if you look at Luke 23, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. That is a lesson to us. That is not to be an anthem that we repeat. I mean that. That's a lesson. We have learned this. This happened. It is not to be repeated over and over and over. Christ should not be in the throne room looking to God and saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. No. That's unacceptable. If you call yourself a child of God and a true believer in his word, to hear this should wreck you at your soul. We're not called to have a continuance of, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. That was for one moment in an instance of life before the death of Jesus and the forgiveness that we needed. We know of these things now, therefore we go further trying to be more like him. We go further in acting as disciples, as Christians, living peacefully with all, leading them to a Savior who said one time, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing, not who continues to say it. If you live your life right now, if you are living the life that needs Jesus' continuance of, Father, forgive them. For, forgive, put your name in the blank. They know not what they're doing. Then I would sit and say, what are you doing here this morning? What are you doing with this book in your hand? Are you reading it? Are you learning from it? Because if so, that doesn't need to be where your name gets filled in. Instead, your name could be filled in the book of life. Instead, your name could be once spoken in the throne room when we go to heaven, when we bask in the riches. Where does your name lie? Is your name in this umbrella caught in the fact of no, forgive me, I'm still a wayward person, I don't know right from wrong. No, it's not. The church and God's word has been in this world far too long for you to have that excuse. People in your lives have tried to share with you before. Better yet, who are the people in your lives that may use this as their excuse? Who are the people in your life that sit and say, well, I didn't know good from wrong. I didn't know right from, oh, oh, oh I didn't know. The cross has been in this world and known for what it is for far too long. When we get closer to Resurrection Sunday, you're going to learn from me. You know why more people don't know about it? Because we call it Easter. It's not Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday. It's the day that he defeats the grave and conquers it. It's not Easter. I don't need some weird pagan fertility holiday. I need Resurrection Sunday. I need a Savior who said, forgive me for what I have done and has taught me how to live as a disciple. I need scripture to evaluate my life. And I need a community built in the body of Christ. That's what I need. What do you need? Is it for the service to make you feel good? Is it for a specific song to be played? Is it for things to be preached how you want to hear it? If you could say, well, yeah, to any of those then I'll tell you the truth. Church isn't for you. It's for Christ. It's for us coming under Him. It's for us growing under Him. We come here and gather to worship. Not you. Not I. But Him. 
Let us pray. Father, it's at this time now, Lord, we, we need you. God, I ask that, that in this time as we partake into to the Last Supper, the supper that recognizes you, that recognizes the Son you sent, that God, we understand that this world isn't our own, but it is yours that we live in. It is yours that we have broken, and yet you still love us, and yet you still forgive. Father, I ask that those in this room that are having struggles, whether it be a health, a financial, a relationship, whatever it may be, that, God, they bring it before you today. That before they take their elements of, of communion and honoring of you, that they reconcile with their heart to you. That they give to you their whole spirit, not half, not some, but all. That we are equipped and gifted in your body and in your blood to not just be those who are believers, but to be those that are called as radically transformed Christians, disciples, those called into this world, not to persecute and judge, but to help build and bring to you. Lord, it is in this time that we honor you in remembrance of you. Amen. I'd ask the balcony, if you would, come down, join us for communion. While you take communion today, again, the, the front's open, y'all. If you want prayer, if you want to stay up here and pray, some call it an altar call. I'm calling it being family. If you're struggling, you're hurting, I'm right there. Better yet, look at everybody in the room. They're here. Not for us, but for him. Let us honor that. Once was crowned
as you sit in the pew that you're in and you're in prayer right now, as you take your elements, again I ask you, who do you need to forgive? But also, who do you need to approach and forgive for the way you acted? Let us not allow the part of Scripture from Luke to be the thing that we live our lives by. Let us not be the ones that are just living because we know not what we're doing. Let us be known as the body of Christ that knows, that believes, and that honors. Let us be the ones that love Christ with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul. I'd ask then, as you finish your prayer, know that you don't have to hurry and jump up and stand with us, but I ask that you would then stand when you're ready and we sing about the mighty, mighty God that we serve and how he has saved us. Let us worship. Rather than seeking some sort of revenge or hurt or pain upon someone, we overcome evil in this world by doing good to those who hurt and wound us. I know we're not all anxious and excited to go out to someone who wronged you back in third grade and pushed you down. Or I'm, not, I'm not chasing after that. But I also want you to sit and think of the times you've been wronged. Always know that we are to be the mirror image of Christ. And if we have taught people it's okay to be that, we need to turn our mirror back towards him instead of this world we live in. Seek reconciliation. Live peacefully amongst all. Let us be the body. 
And then for our benediction and our closing scripture, I, I, I felt this to be the, the most pertinent one that we could share. And it, and it focuses on that you've been called because of Christ. You are called to live a way like this because you call yourself his. And so if you would all please join me in reading 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. 1 Peter 2, 21. Follow in his example. Love those who persecute and harm you. Let us rid this world of evil with good, that is the gospel. If you came today prepared to, to give, we, we ask that you do so generously. We get to do great things. We've got youth things happening, the Sunday school things happening. There's a few other things that are coming. We've got a, I'll, I'll leak the special information. We've got a Christmas program that's coming with our kiddos. And it's because of your generosity. The church gets to do great things like that. Maybe I'll buy another sports coat. I don't know. Try and dress up more. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I won't buy another sports coat. <laughs> Church, thank you for being here. Thank you for putting yourselves before Scripture today to be examined. Don't let it stop here, though. Take your time with God all this week. Have a blessed week. We hope to see you at Sunday school.